In a shocking 1700s historical document to black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes, also known as black Jews, were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your ebook and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option one. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option two, get an easy to read edited ebook plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of ten dollars. Option three, get an audiobook for easy listening plus the easy to read edited ebook and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of fifteen dollars. Learn the real history they don't want you to know. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, uh, there's a there's a sift you as wheat line that Yeshua uh, tells Peter. He says, you know, Satan would like to have you and sift you as wheat. And so we're going to look at this this prophetic harvest language, its continuation from from uh, from last week. Uh, before we do that, we're going to look at our Hebrew nugget. It comes from a book called The Short History of the Cops and of their church. Uh, it was a book written in 1873, but the timeline that it's referencing is around 640 AD, somewhere around in there. So this is this is huge. And it reads, it says, uh, and the time of the Christian rule lasted from the ascension of the Messiah until Egypt was opened and the Christians from among uh, the, the Kip and then it's got cops were brought under the Muslim, Muslim, Muslim yoke. So it's talking about from the time that Christ was resurrected until uh, they were brought under the, the control of the Muslims. All right. And it was talking about that, that Christian rule. Uh, so it said, but during part of that time, they were under the power of the Romans and Greeks who put them to the worst of death by the cross, by fire, by stoning, by breaking their bones asunder. But a part of that time also they were their own masters owing to the kings becoming Christians. Now this, this I want to stop there and just, just put that this in perspective. So it was saying from the time of the resurrection of Christ up until around about this time, you know, 600, you know, AD, uh, you know, they were you know, you know, from a, from from the historical perspective, you know, they were fighting against the Romans and Greeks, pretty much the, the Christians. Now, we have to understand that the first Christians were the Hebrews, black Hebrews. So most of the people that were being persecuted, were still Hebrews, they were just, you know, they when they got to Egypt, they they went by the name of the cops uh, or the Coptic uh, Christians. All right. So then it says. Know that the land of Egypt, when the Muslims entered into it, was full of Christians, but divided among themselves in two sects, both as to the race and two religions. The one part was made up of men about the court and public affairs, all Greek from among the soldiers of Constantinople, the seat of government of Rome. Their views, as well as their religion, were for all of them, Melchizedek. Okay. And their number was above 300,000 all Greeks. So it's dividing it up in two groups. So there were these two groups of Christians. One of them, he was saying, uh, you know, was, uh, you know, the Constantine type Christians. Then he goes and says another group. He said the other portion was the whole people of Egypt who were called Kipt and were of mixed descent. So he's saying the people of Kipt or Egypt, were, there were different groups of people in among them. He said, uh, among whom one could not distinguish cop from Abyssinian. So when he uses the word cop, he's talking about uh, the Coptic Christians. So he said, among whom one could not di distinguish cop from Abyssinian, Nubian, or Israelites. So there were different groups of people in Africa. One was Abyssinian, one was Nubian, one was Israelite. All right. And he's saying the cops, which were the Christians, you couldn't tell the Christians from 
the Abyssinians, the Nubians, or the Israelites. So they're using Israelites as those uh, who had not converted over to the faith. And it throws this other line in there since they were all Jacobites. This, this is you. So all of the Coptic Christians were considered themselves to be Jacobites. Jacobites, descendants of Jacob. All right. So they were still, you know, descendants of, of Israel, descendants of Jacob, but they were Coptic Christians. And you couldn't tell them from the Nubians. You couldn't tell them from the Abyssinians. You couldn't tell them from the other Israelites. They all looked the same. And some of them were writers and government officers. Others were merchants and tradesmen. Others were bishops and uh, presbyters and such like. Others were tillers of the land in the country. So you, this is a good resource. Downloaded it. It's in the old books folder. So check out the old books folder. And just read this if you can. I mean, we, I know we got a lot of resources out here, and it's hard to really get through all of them. But, you know, there's just a lot of information out there if you want to know who we are as people. All right. So sift you is weak, prophetic harvest uh, language. So we talked about the three main seasons. Uh, you know, we talked about the Feast of Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, which happened in the spring. And we've talked about Pentecost, which happens in the summer. And we just got past the Feast of uh, uh, Trumpets and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. So after that, we talked about uh, how Yeshua was saying, you know, don't come back to him empty that each one of these uh, holy days that, that he mentions is a harvest time. He said, when you, when you come back to the harvest, uh, you should have done some things and you should have something to bring back to me. And if you don't have something to bring back to me, he said, it's on you because I'm going to give you everything you need to complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the things that's needed to bring in a harvest. All right, we talked about the former and the latter rains. The former rains would happen, you know, in around October, you know, so that the ground could get soft and you could go out and do your uh, your your planting and your plowing. And the latter rain, which came in the springs, we talked about how the former rain, the latter rain, you know, is a picture of Yeshua and uh, his provision as well as, uh, as his first and his second coming. All of those things are in prophetic uh, to him. Uh, we talked about how, uh, you know, that the rains, uh, you know, were there to get, you know, get get the fields ready to plow. Without the rains, you couldn't plow, you couldn't plant. And the things that uh, the, the farmer was doing uh, while he was getting ready for the rains to come, you know, preparing his instrumentation. We talked about the plow and the yoke, the goad, the plowing, the mattock, you know. Then we talked about the harvest after all these things pointing to the end of the age or end of the world. So go back and listen to that if you hadn't. So you can just gather up that information because we're going now into uh, harvest terminology, you know, because the scriptures are full of harvest terminology. You know, it, it talks about plowing. It talks about the yoke. It talks about the goal. It talks about the magic. Now we're getting to the point we're talking about the harvest tool. So it's time for the harvest. The springtime comes in. Uh, the the crops have grown up, and now it's it's time to go out and gather in the crops. What well, the uh, harvest tools that you had to go out and cut the harvest down with was called a sickle. All right, so the barley and and the uh, the barley and the wheat, you, you had to have a sickle to go out there and cut them down. Now, what's interesting about the sickle that initially, when we go back into Old Testament scripture, um. Uh, they they use a jawbone uh, of of some of the animals, uh, particularly like a jawbone of an ass, as a as a as a sickle type uh, instrument. And where the teeth are, I don't know if you can see this here, but it, where the teeth are, they would put metal, uh, you know, flint. They use flint at some point. They use bronze and and other at other points in history, brass was put in there. Anyway, it was sharp uh, metal that was put in here where the teeth would be, and they could go through and they could just cut it down. Now, this picture below here is a modern day picture of what a sickle would look like. All right, so all throughout scripture, you see terminology about the sickle and, and the time of harvest. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah speaks of him that handles the sickle in the time of harvest. And so if you don't understand what he's talking about, the harvest time, you, you really, you know, it just it's just words. And uh, 
And Joel, he talks about put ye in the sickle for the harvest is ripe, you know. And so he's talking about going out and making his harvest. Except he's talking about a harvest of soul. Souls are not a harvest of wheat or barley. But the barley and the wheat represent the harvest of the souls. And so when we get to Judges, like 15, and you see Samson, who takes the jawbone of an ass and he goes out and he defeats his enemy with it. Uh, it's a prophetic uh, harvest tool. He goes out and he kills a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. So something that was meant to be a harvesting tool was turned into a weapon to defeat the enemy. Goes back to the same idea last week when we talked about turning your plowshares into swords. Same thing that you were using the harvest is the same thing that you were using uh, to fight with. So when we go back to Judges, we see uh, Samson using his jawbone and is prophetically pointing to uh, this fight that's going to happen uh, during the harvest time. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, when you study Samson, you, you realize that, you know, he's from the tribe of Dan. So it's pointing to uh, the time of the Antichrist. Uh, you know, he's he allows himself to be tricked by a woman and he ends up basically sacrificing himself, allowing his power to be taken from him so that, you know, he could in, end up defeating his enemy. He ended up defeating his enemy when he was stretched out wide. He was stretched out wide and he he brought the house down on all his enemy. So even in his death, he defeated all of his enemies, all of these things pointing to Yeshua. And then when you look at this idea of the sickle, it's also pointing to a harvest, a harvest time. So there's a powerful, powerful imagery all throughout uh, the Old Testament when we begin to see how the harvest tools are prophetic, how they're pointing to other times. And so he's given us clues as to what's going to happen by using ideas of things that have already happened. The next step, after you cut the sheaves down uh, with, with the jawbone or the sickle, the sheaves, they will be bi bound together and they would be taken uh, they would be taken somewhere else to the threshing floor so that the straw and all the other items that that's on or surrounding the the fruit or the grain could be separated all right so you see this terminology like in psalms uh 129 and 7 it's saying that the psalmist is making reference to the mower filling his hand and the binder of sheaves filling in his bosom Song of Solomon speaks of a heap of wheat, and Joseph in his dream saw binding sheaves in the field. So when we study Joseph and we see the binding of the sheaves, we understand this is harvest terminology here. So the uh, cut grain was gathered in the arms and bound into sheaves. Now, what was the purpose of taking it to the threshing floor? The purpose of the threshing floor was to rub out the grain, separate uh, the grain from the straw and all these these other things because you're trying to get to the fruit of what you needed. And so, um, you know, you take it to the threshing floor. The threshing floor uh, was, was real flat and it was fixed so that nothing else would mix in with it from the floor. And so uh, this, this reading here says that, that, that by its form and weight, uh, the grain sinks uh, immediately through the straw and it escapes uh, being hurt. The straw, which would by its lightness remains on the surface, is slowly broken and crushed into tiny pieces. Thus, a double process goes on by the means of this uh, simple but effective treatment. Now, when, when we study this and we and we see how the grain is being separated from uh, the straw, I want you to think of it in terms of us being presented before the most high getting ready to be presented before the most high all right because we're we were the good seed that were planted so if we were the good seed that were planted then during harvest time the seed has sprouted up and produced fruit if you want to look at it like that and so now all of the things uh that are not going to make it into the heavenlies before the most high is now being separated out all right so this is the imagery so the straw and all those things are being separated out from the grain because only the grain is going to be brought in. All right. So now, uh, you know, when Yeshua gets ready to bring us in, he's got to separate us from our flesh. 
All right. So, you know, there's a process that he sends us through so that he can distinguish between the fruit and the trash. Because he said, flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I want, that's the picture I want you to see when we start talking about the threshing, uh, this process of threshing, the, the, the rubbing out the grain, separating the, the flesh from the, from the spirit. So there was three methods of threshing that were used in the old time. One of them, they use a small flail uh, to do small quantities. We see Ruth uh, probably using this type of instrument. So when you when you go uh, to Ruth, I won't read this whole thing. But the second instrument that was used uh, was like uh, some some wooden planks that were used, and they were pulled across the grain. They had sharp, uh, 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 you know, cut holes and stones and all that stuff and metal, and they would drive it across the grain, and they were, that was separated. But the most common one uh, was using the oxen to to walk over the grain. All right, and this this was the most effective way and the most common way that our people uh, used uh, to separate. This is called the method of threshing. And in the, in the scripture for the Hebrew verb, it, it means to thresh. It means uh, to trample down or to tread underfoot. So when you see this type of terminology of treading underfoot or trampling down, it's talking about a threshing, all right? Separating out uh, the trash, the straw from the actual fruit. Now, once it's it's separated, it's still all together, but it's separated. And so there's a process called winnowing that had to take place. And uh, the winnowing um, was accomplished by using a shovel or wooden fork. And normally there was, you know, there was a barn that they would they would take this stuff to where they could throw it up into the air. And what would happen the barn was, was set up in a certain way so that when they tossed it in the air and they threw it against the wind that was blowing, the grain, would because it was heavy, it would fall directly down. And then the straw, it would blow over a little bit into its own pile. And then the other trash would blow into another area of the barn where it would be burned. So it was like three, three areas of uh, that this this would happen. And so when we see the winnowing process, we see the tossing up, we see the uh, the separation of the straw, what you would call the chaff, and then you see all of the other trash go somewhere else to be burned. And um, so when the Bible speaks of the farmer's fan, it's not talking about a separate instrument. It was talking about the shovel or the wooden fork that was used. And the prophet Jeremiah tells of, of, of Yah using a fan to winnow his, his people. And he says, I have winnowed them with a fan in the gates of the land. So when the grain and straw uh, was thrown into the air, the wind caused the mass of material to fall as follows. Since the grain is the heaviest, it naturally falls beneath the fan. The straw is blown to the side into a heap, and the lighter chaff and the dust are carried beyond into a flattened windrow. So when the when the psalmist reads this in Psalms one and four, he said, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. The chaff is burned, as scripture often indicates, and the flame consumes the chaff. Uh, John the Baptist was familiar with the winnowing process and the burning of the chaff. And he said, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So you can see the terminology uh, that's being used in, uh, in the New Testament scripture, but it's all prophetic harvest language. And so we have to understand what process of the harvest are we in when he starts talking about fanning his hand, purging the floor and gathering his wheat and burning the chaff. What part of this are, 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 is he talking about? Now we have to apply this to ourselves and say, he's taking us through this process. He's taking us through this process when he, when he gathers us up, he's taking through the process of, of being trampled so that we can separate out, you know, the, the flesh or the straw or the chaff from the fruit, from the spirit, the separation, uh, uh, you know, and he's asking us to do this on a daily basis to, to separate 
uh, you know, the flesh from the spirit, that this war that's going on inside of us, he's asking us to go ahead and start making that separation now. So when the winnowing time comes, that process has already taken place. So then there was this, this last process called the sifting and the grinding of the grain. And he said, when the winnowing process is over, then comes the sifting of the grain. The wheat or barley will still be more or less mixed with certain amounts of chaff, little stones, and perhaps some tares. So sifting is therefore necessary before the grain can, can be uh, ground into meal. This is the task of the women. The sifter seats herself on the floor, shakes the sieve, which contains the grain, until the chaff begins to, the chaff begins to appear on the top, and this is blown away by long power. The stones are removed, as are also the tears. Now, Yeshua made reference to this process, to the sifting of Simon Peter. And he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. This is a powerful text. Because Simon is is bent on, you know, supporting Yeshua. You know, he's already been through this process where Yeshua has told him somebody's going to betray him, you know, and all these things. And and he's determined that he can he can he he's not going to do it in his own flesh. And so Yeshua is warning him that there's a sifting coming because he didn't stop the sifting. He, he warned him. He said, "Satan want to sift you." He didn't prevent him from being sifted, but what he did was he said that uh, I pray for you already about this sifting that's going to happen to you, about this separation that's going to happen. He said, I pray for you already that your faith fail. I'm not praying that you won't be sifted because you're going to be sifted. He said, but I'm praying for you that your faith, while you're being sifted, fails not. All right, and then he went on to tell him immediately after that, you know, when he said, "No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it," he said, "I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stick to you with you to the end." He said, "Before this night is over, you, you, you know, uh, and before the cock crows thrice, you're gonna deny me three times," because he was trying to get him from depending upon his flesh. It's still some sifting that I got to do with you. It's still some chaff in there. It's still some pebbles in there. He said, but I pray for you already. When I convert you over, he said, then you'll be able to understand what I'm trying to tell you. All right. So he was sifted. Matthew 24, 40 through 22. He says, then shall two be in the field and the one shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be grinding at the meal. The one shall be taken. And the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour uh, uh, Yeshua doth come, right? So, this grinding at the meal language, and this in the field, the field is pointing to the fact that they're out there in the harvest with the sickle, gathering in the sheep, all right? And then they're going through this process, and, the, and these women that are at the meal. And they're doing the grinding. They're doing the sifting and the grinding at the meal. All right. So this point to harvest language. All right. So uh, when these things happen, he's telling us what, what season these things are going to happen in. Because we know when this particular type of harvest happens. Amos 9 and 9. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. Like as corn is sifted in the sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. So he's making a promise. He, he said, you know, uh, you know, I'm going to take care of y'all. You're going to be sifted. Uh, you're going to go through the process of, of just like the natural wheat is going through its process. You're going to go through the same process. And I'm using a language where you understand that when the sifting come, I've already prayed for you. So I prayed for you, not that you won't go through the sifting, but when you go through the sifting, your faith will not fail. And so, you know, we, we've got to see this language that the Most High is using. we got to see what he's saying is going to happen. Oftentimes we get caught up because we think we shouldn't go through anything. Yeshua said, no, nah, you got to go through a sifting process. Your faith is always on trial. 
do you believe what you say you believe? But I promise you, if you if you suffer with me, he said, you'll reign with me. He talks about in Isaiah 30, 27 to 28, Behold, the name of Yahuwah coming from four, burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are, are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire, and his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with the sea of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. So he's using language. Harvest language so we can get a great idea of what he's talking about. So I just wanted to talk about this sifting that we have to go through, this process that we have to go through. And we can judge ourselves and allow ourselves to be sifted now, allow ourselves to go through what we got to go through and get through this thing. He said, if you judge yourself, he said, when it comes down to this sifting process that everybody got to go through, he said, it won't be anything left for, for, for you to be sifted out because you've already judged yourself. He said, but the rest of Israel, you know, who has not gone through this process, will have to go through this sifting, this winnowing, this threshing uh, process. And so he said, either you do it, uh, you know, yourself through your through judging yourself or, you know, when the time comes, I'll have to just send you through it uh, myself. And so it's a combination of things. You know, we go through things as well, you know, that helps us, uh, you know, it goes back to the goading again. Last week, when we talked about the gold being pushed into certain circumstances where we have to endure uh, certain things for a while. He said, but after you have endured, you know, he has a promise for us. And so he's using this language so that we can not only know the, the steps and the processes and things that we're going to have to go through to separate ourselves from our flesh. He gives us the timing that is going to happen in. He gives us the, the harvest season that these things are going to happen in. So it's just important for us to, you know, get an understanding of it. Now, this is not it's not, it's really not for everybody, you know, um, but if you're a serious student of this, this is important to understand because scripture is full of this type of language. And so it's good to have a, a grasp of what he's saying to us when he's speaking to us through the prophets, when he's speaking to us, uh, when Yeshua is talking to us, and he's using language and what steps of the process that we're in. Uh, at certain times is good, you know, it helps us. It helps us uh, with our discernment uh, when we start lining things up on the timeline uh, to know where we are. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. I hope it helps. Uh, you know, when we started talking about the winnowing and the threshing, and the, you know, and the, and the tools that like Samson was using when he used his jawbone. Uh, you know, of an ass, it was it, the prophetic picture that, that was there, having to do with the sickle and the harvest and all these type things it was there. We just didn't, we just didn't see it. So he didn't just arbitrarily use the jawbone of an ass that had no significance. There was meaning there that Yah was wanting us to see. All right, so I'll stop right there and open it for, up for any questions if you have any. All right, John. Give a mute off. So this is uh, this is different or a precursor um, to like if you don't take care of this sifting yourself, then you know getting getting all the trash, getting all the what's not usable burned in fire. Um, but even even if you are chosen or saved, but you might still have to go through that portion of. Of, of the process, right? It's it's a little. I made sense. Yeah, with that. It, it makes sense. It, you know, um, yeah. I mean, you know, we're gonna go through what we gotta go through. You know, and okay. how we handle that. You know, uh, I guess is a better way of putting it. Okay. Um, you know, you know, because we can go through things and not handle it right, not understand, you know, and be angry with y'all and why are you putting me through these things and why am I going through this and we don't we don't. We're not walking in faith and we don't take advantage of the opportunity that he gives us to, um, you know, to judge ourselves Okay. while we're in these circumstances. Um, he, he talks about us being offended by him. 
and 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 that means that we we allow the circumstances that we're going through uh, to cause us to begin to distrust in one in whom we all to trust and obey. And it's, it's easy. I mean, we see it. We we start going through stuff, and we say, "Why me? Why am I going through? What you know? What you know?" And 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 we want him to fulfill promises for us that he didn't give us. We want him to uh, help us out on a on a dream that he, what he wasn't he didn't give us. And so, you know, I've been guilty of it, you know, when I was young, especially I had my own dreams, and my own goals, and I had my own things that I want to do. And I wanted to sprinkle a little bit of him on it. And I couldn't figure out why he wouldn't help me with this thing. <laughs> yeah. Y'all you know, you know get what I'm saying? And so, it, and, and so I'm trying to get him to line up with my plans and my desires yeah. and what I want rather than me lining up with what he wanted and his desires and all these things. And then he said, all the other things he said will be added unto you, but you got to get on my plan. I don't have to get on your plan. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we we mess up because we, we do. We, we think he ought to line up. You know, I went to school. I did this and I did this and I did this. And, I, and therefore these things ought to happen for me because I did all the thing that this world has told me I should do. And I'm expecting you, Lord, to, to, to get on board with this. And then we start comparing ourselves to our neighbors and say, look at how good they, they went through the process. They're doing good. Uh, th their husband is doing this and their wife is doing this. And look at the house that they got and, and, their, and their car and their children. They go to the right school and they got this. And look at the clothes. I mean, we just do all of these things. And we were thinking because we got the wrong doctrine that this is what he's telling us in Scripture. And then when it doesn't line up like we think it ought to line up, we get bitter with him over promises that he didn't make. And then, you know, and so when we do that, we don't take advantage of the opportunity to judge ourselves and say, wait a minute, what did I get wrong about what he said? And so when I started getting the scripture and I started seeing that he was saying stuff like, if you suffer with me, you'll reign with me. I, I started seeing that the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruits of the spirit was long suffering. I started seeing the prophet say, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I heard Paul say the sufferings of this present time and I even worried it to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So I began to understand that this whole process is about, you know, trusting the promise, even in when the promise don't look right, even when the present circumstance don't look right. Amen. And so that's where faith comes in. Then we start understanding what he means by it when he says, uh, you know, uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. You, you can't walk by what you see. That's what he's telling us. But yet we go right back to walking about what we see. So, you know, that's what we're going to be judged by. How did we walk? How do we judge ourselves? You know, when I find fault in me, you know, how do I handle that fault? Or do I even see fault in me? Do I see fault in everybody else but me? So James challenges, and he said that he said the word, what the word ought to do is be like a mirror. You know, because if you got something on your face and you look in the mirror, the word should show you that you got you got some issues. He said, Who mm -hmm. looks in a mirror and they got spots all over their face and they don't wash their face? They just look at the mirror, see all the mess on their face, and walk away without doing anything and go out into the world with all that mess on their face. Who does that? And he said, that's what the word ought to do for us if we're in the word. It ought to put a mirror up to our face and say, you need to wash yourself. And judge yourself. What, what I find myself doing, like if it's something that I'm dealing with, and I'm, I'm praying, I'm asking for him to deliver me from this thing or to take care of this thing, and I, I have to... I'm finding out that, you know, I don't know, you, you, you know, if I'm looking for a, a manifestation of the deliverance, 
as opposed to believing that he that he delivered me from something. But then on the same hand, I'm finding out I have to take responsibility because he gave me the holy ruach to handle it. And I'm I you know I just I've always you know you you learn well you just pray about it. Mm -hmm. but nobody never talks about your responsibility. You know, and so I, I'm I'm still learning that and I'm finding that out. That's that's a hard thing to, you know, to kind of deal with, you know, Lord, why ain't, why am I still dealing with this? Well, then I gotta say, but you know, I gotta keep, I gotta keep. If I have to get on my knees every day to keep praying about that same thing, that's what I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and that and that's, it is tough when you especially when you first start getting in it, you know, because you, you like you're going through something, you want to bring you out of it. And he's saying, mm -hmm. No, I, I want you to trust me in it. Right. Do you believe that whatever you're in is something that surprised me? Yeah. And then, no. you, you know what I'm saying? Do you believe that, that you're in a situation that he didn't know you were going to be in? Mm -hmm. You know, and so he's not surprised where I am. And if I'm in that thing, I'm in that thing for a reason. And so now I had to go to him and say, okay, I'm in this thing for a reason. I'm going through this for a reason. You won't pull me out. So what is it that you want me to learn while I'm in it? Wow. That's good stuff. Yeah. So, you know, because that's what he does. You know, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey, but then I'm in a desert. Right. And I'm thirsty. <laughs> and I'm hungry. Do I still believe the promise? Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Yeah, because what I'm seeing don't make sense. I'm in a desert. Where my milk and honey? I'm I'm thirsty. Where my milk and honey? I'm hungry. Where my milk and honey? Did you Moses? Did you bring us out here to die? I was better off back where I was. Because I'm still looking at it through my flesh. Right. So. It's not by what we see, it's what we know. What do we know? You get what I'm saying? All right. Uh, I hear you. Yeah. All right, Hank. Hey, shalom, everybody. Shalom. shalom. Hey, uh, you, um, in the, the scripture you used in, um, I think it was Luke, where Yeshua was telling Peter, Satan wants to sift you as we. And then on your slide, you talked about the sifting process and you talked about it being the, the task of the women. Now, we can have a lot of fun with that. Uh, just just if we wanted to, you know, talking about Satan sifting and the women's task being sifting, but we won't. But then you show you talk about um, in another set of scripture in the Old Testament, you, you talked about how the most high um, is going to sift Israel. And so can you, you, you talk a little bit about the, the, the difference in the sifting of Satan versus the sifting of the most high and, and what's the, what is the, you know, the, the end state or the end goal uh, that is desired in, in both of those, those scenarios? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, most high, you know, he, he even when Satan is, is doing the sifting, he, he still you know, takes credit for it. That's one right. thing. So he's, right. you know, he's allowing, you know, we talked about, you know, when we, we had the discussion of the day, we talked about the lying spirit mm -hmm. that was sent among the people. You know, Yah still takes credit for that lying spirit. Right. You know, um, so, uh, yeah, the end goal is what we've talked about when we studied the the, um, the apocalypse of Paul or where we, we talked about, the, you know, the judgment where we go through the fire, wood, uh, you know, wood, hay and stubble. Mm -hmm. You see the terminology there now, the wood, hay, and stubble. Right. Uh, and versus the gold, silver, and precious stone. Uh, mm -hmm. So all, all of those things, you know, uh, you know, are, are related. So the goal of the of the sifting is to separate us from our flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, how much I've done that on you know, uh through the process of relationship will determine what my reward is. Mm -hmm. and you see some who uh you know are taken out you know uh 
and, and won't have to go through a certain process during the tribulation period. And then you see others who will have to go through certain processes of the tribulation period in order to separate themselves from their flesh. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you see with the with the with the grains. I hope I'm hit kind of hitting what you're what you're asking for. If not, just follow back up. With me. No, no, no. You you are you are. I mean, I I don't I don't believe, and you you know, you tell me if I'm if I'm not thinking about this in the right way. I don't think that you know the Most High is going to allow us to go you know to go through a a, a, a sifting you know the you know the Satan induced or Satan led. And then we come out of that, and then he's going to take us through another one. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. He's going to utilize the efforts of you know Satan, you know, to accomplish his results, accomplish his goals. I think, and he's going to he has the ability to do that, do that himself. And there's a scripture somewhere. I think Paul didn't Paul talk about giving somebody over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh? Yeah, it was uh, one of the uh, men in the church. Yeah, disobedient, and I can't remember what he was doing. He was sleeping with his brother's wife or so, his something father's like wife yeah. or something yeah. like that, and uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't repent of it. And they were saying, "Well, you know, if he won't repent, he was getting on to the church and saying, y'all need to do something about that." And eventually, Paul said, "You know, we're going to turn his body over mm -hmm. to Satan so that his spirit might be saved." Right. So he sent him through this process, this sifting, this this uh, this process, right. so he could. You know, he could he could be judged in his body so that the end result right. of his judgment would still come out, you know, on his behalf. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. And maybe we'll come back to the the you know the comparison of Satan sifting and the women sifting. We'll come back to the future. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll let you put that together and um <laughs> we're discussing. I'll be on that video. <laughs> that that burning of the wood, hay, and stubble <laughs> was uh, where I was going. That was the question. You just answered it. That's that 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 part of the judgment. Yeah, because it's pointing to the flesh. It's pointing mm -hmm. to uh, when you look at the at the grains. It's pointing to all of that part of the grain that's unnecessary. The the hay part, the the chaff, the chaff, all that stuff. He wants to get rid of that. And so when we when we ourselves go through the judgment, and and maybe we'll talk about that as well uh, in another lesson where he talks about the fire. You know, we we talked about it somewhat when we talked about it in the apocalypse of Paul having a you know some believers dying and having to stand in the river of fire. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's another fire that he's gonna. He's gonna. It's a few of them. Gonna blow uh, across the face of the earth, and 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 Israel is gonna have to walk through it on the earth. So we need to really talk about that a little bit more. But yeah, and that's pointing to that fire that he was talking about. Uh, with, that's with, a hard with, concept because conventional Christianity, you know, you you're not hearing that. Mm -hmm. But it's in the they book. Got, they got it yeah, right. They got mm -hmm. everybody. They got everybody just going to heaven and the by and by. They ain't talking about, you know, burning no wood, stay or wood or stubble or hay, you know, any other kind of judgment is just, you know, either in the book of life or, or you're not, you know. So I appreciate you getting deeper into this subject because it's a whole lot of stuff. I'm like, wow, this is this is mind blowing and just the fact that it's out there. And 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 I did. I'm speaking for myself. Didn't know it. Mm -hmm. Didn't know it existed. You know. Didn't didn't see another perspective of this. And it's 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 enlightening, but it's scary as well. Yeah. Just to now to now be aware of it. Yeah, and and anyway, that's, that's yeah, that's a powerful statement. I, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, because it it is when he makes statements to us like. We gotta give an account for everything we've done in this body. That should be that should kind of wake you up a little bit. And then he says we gotta give an account for every idle word that comes out of our mouth. All right, so he's he's telling us that nothing that we do is gonna go unjudged. Wow. All right. Uh, you know, so you know, and, and this is for That's our so you know our judge our rewards and all these things. And he says, not going to go and judge. And so he said, now what I want you to do 
I'm giving you the opportunity to judge yourself. Hallelujah. And if you say if you judge yourself, you will not be judged. I mean, that's that's powerful. That's an opportunity. Right? Yeah. So we, we've got to learn how to take advantage of that opportunity because he's not going to just let stuff go un, you know, dealt with, if you want to put it like that. But that is a myth in the way that people are teaching uh, in the, in the, in the uh, you know, Constant, Constantine Church. You, you know, you just, you got your, your forgiveness. You know, there's no other responsibility for anything else. And then he's just going to come and snatch you up out of here. And you're never even going to think about all that evil stuff that you did. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it, it, it just don't line up. It don't line up with him being a just God. Does it? Right. So right. can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, real quick. Is that Mr. Uh, Daniels the is fire that, be on the earth. You said we're going to have to walk through fire on the earth? Well, those who are here. That that's I'm thinking out, and I'll find that scripture. Maybe I shouldn't have brought it up, but there's a fire that's gonna be that he's gonna spread across the whole earth, and it appears that those who are on the earth, only those of his, will be able to walk through the fire and not get burned. Okay. But, but we'll have to talk about that a little bit uh, more in depth. Okay. Yeah. All right, Mr. Daniels. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the insight into the uh, the jawbone uh, that Samson used. I never could understand what the significant the significance was. It always struck me as odd. Like he could have used anything, uh, grab a sword, grab you know, grab a spear, but um, it it just uh, I guess makes you realize that nothing in the scriptures are, is wasted. Like God uses every single thing to point to what he's going to do, uh, who he is, who his son is. Like there's nothing in the Bible that is arbitrary. Um, the other thing that um, I didn't know that the oxen actually stepped on the grain itself. And then it made me think of the scriptures where it says, do not muzzle the oxen. Um you know, it talks about that in Deuteronomy, uh, Corinthians, and in Timothy, that the, the oxen should not be muzzled. Uh, and to Hank's point, um, the sifting part, uh, it I thought about the character of the person who's sifting. Satan is an accuser, so he's sifting to look for, to accuse you, you know, to lay accusation. He's a thief, he's a liar. Um, and and it also made me think of the the um, the, revel, uh, the I guess the revelations of Paul, uh, where the spirits would come up to see if they could find something within that person that you know kind of belonged to them. So there's another uh, uh, um, sifting happening there. We want to see if there's anything in that person that that is of us or something of that nature, however it was termed. And then when you look at the nature and the character of Yeshua, when he sifts you, is not to accuse you, but to purify you so that you are, you are made clean and holy. So I think the sifting, again, you have to look at the character of the sifter. Are you looking to, to accuse or are you looking, you know, to help purify? And, and so those are the two uh, things that were uh, in my mind as, as Hank was asking that question and you were talking about sifting and all this other stuff. It, yeah, that's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, you know, when you talk about the, you know, go back to Peter. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what Satan was doing. He was accusing him. He wanted to bring out his stuff because he wanted to prove that everybody is just as bad as he is. So he's the great accuser, you know, not understanding the grace and mercy of, of, of the Most High. And they did. He pointed out some things that was wrong with Peter, but he didn't understand the work of, of Yeshua. You know, the work of Yeshua was going to, uh, you know, was going to justify Peter, not himself. So that's a great point. Also, the, uh, the uh, you know, not muzzling the uh, ox, uh, oxen is a great point because when they were threshing, uh, doing the threshing floor, the hay and stuff that came off of it, the straw that came off of it, they would take that straw, mix it with barley, and they would allow the oxen to eat of that food. And, you know, because they're saying you're out here doing the work and I'm going to give you a portion back of the work from the work that you're that you're doing. And so that's why they wouldn't muzzle it. You know, they wouldn't let it do all that work and walk on all of that 
barley and that wheat and not allow it to eat some of the hay that came off. So that's, those are excellent, excellent points. All right. Anybody else? All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, you know, everything goes back, you know, to things that we've already talked. And I'm hoping that it reinforces. I'm hoping that, it, you know, it, it, that you see what he's saying now, you know, at least in part from a harvest language perspective. And now we can dive a little bit deeper in some of these scriptures and see, uh, you know, start getting a, even a deeper meaning of what what he's trying to uh, what he's trying to say to us. Let's pray, Father. We just want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to come together and and discuss uh, all the wonderful things that you've prepared for us and all the wonderful things that you you just keep doing uh, for us. We ask you to continue to open up our hearts and minds to what you want us to see and not what the world wants us to see. Father, you know, we have uh, members among us that, uh, you know, are, uh, you know, ha having uh, health issues. Father, we know you got that as well. And so we mentioned Corey. We mentioned James and Julie. We mentioned my cousin, uh, James. want to thank you for Chanel's mom. Keep her, um, keep her, uh, you know, touching her body as she gets better. Uh, you know, and, you know, uh, Karen's aunt and Marcus' mom is having problems with, with flu uh, grandmother's having uh, fluid around her heart. Father, we ask you to touch her and, and relieve her of that. And Father, we, uh, you know, we ask you to continue to uh, to uh, lift those up in the past that have probably We ask you to continue to keep Judy, uh, you know, uh, uh, lifted uh, up before you. She continue to get stronger in her situation as well as others, Father, that are, are struggling. Uh, with help situation. Father, you said you're going to give us a spirit that would help us continue in our suffering and you would give us the gift or the fruit of long suffering. We just want to thank you, Father, for, for, for giving us what we need in order to continue to walk through uh, uh, this, this situation. You said in your word that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. We want to thank you for that. Hallelujah. In your son, Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. 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 In a shocking 1700s historical document of black Americans, a German professor used the term Negro as a reference to black Jews both in Africa and in Portugal. The author also makes a clear distinction between the black Jews and black Moors. The Moors were largely a distinctly different mixture of black people, most of whom had converted to the Muslim faith. The author candidly points out that the black Jews were specifically targeted for the slave trade, and that the black Moors were intentionally avoided, and that the Negroes also known as black Jews were then sent to the Americas during the slave trade. Get your e-book and audiobook bundle today. Choose from the following three options. Option 1. Get free copies of the original 1700s documents only. Option 2. Get an easy-to-read edited e-book plus free copies of the original 1700s document for a low price of $10. Option 3. Get an audiobook for easy listening, plus the easy-to-read edited ebook, and also free copies of the original 1700s document for a low bundle price of $15. Learn the real history they don't want you to know.